Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is a test. This is only a test, but this is a somewhat involved test. I plan on doing these. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to actually do this. I'm testing to see what it's like. I'm planning on doing daily news reports, and I'm. This is this is a look that I'm going to be going for. And what I plan on doing is when I'm shooting the videos, which would be multiple stories using screenshots from the stories, I will do a live stream during which, you know, I'll be, well, you'll see stuff. You'll see like behind the scenes as, as uh, I do the uh, Paul's version, <laughs> Paul's version of the news here. So the, this is the, that was just the basic introduction, which normally you won't hear. So I'm going to begin it like, I, like I'll be beginning it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Newsfire with Paul Gordon, where we set your news on fire. Today's date is May 6th. 2017, and we're going to get right to our first story. Our first story of the day, the headline reads, there it is, ATF rolls into Baltimore to help eliminate their gun violence Problem. That's the headline from Bearing Arms. And we'll go down here and I'll read the, the, the juicy part. To help combat the gun violence problem, the city has the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF. Sorry, when I say an alphabet government department, I get a little sick. In my mouth, has rolled out a new program allowing the city to borrow a quote unquote gun tracing van. That's right, a gun tracing van. The ATF hopes to make this van and others like it accessible to cities nationwide. We're looking for all the help we can get. As you know, our murder rate is up. Murder is out of control. Too many guns on our street. Well, this is a big time gun control zone, so it's weird how there are still guns on the streets. Mayor Catherine Pugh told CBS Baltimore, the idea behind the van is simple. Oh, it's always simple, and it's always life-saving. Using shell casings and evidence to trace a gun owner's guns owner fast. Once we take a recovered firearm, we're able to stick it into the small, the snail trap, discharge the firearm, whereby we can get an exemplar from this particular firearm. It tells you definitively what gun has been tied to what homicide. ATF Firearms Division Chief James Ferguson explains, once the casings are analyzed, the weapons could be connected to other homicides. Sounds like a great idea, folks. And hey, I'm all for solving crimes. I'm all for that. But there's a price to be paid for that. And that is this. If you're going to be able to trace guns, you're going to have to register guns. You're going to need a national database, which, by the way, they already have. A national database that they can access whenever they want. Not a not a database that is used just to do the background check to see if you're allowed to get a gun. Oh no, nothing can go wrong with that, folks. So the price that you pay for folks to be able to trace a firearm and to solve a crime quickly is well is that the government knows exactly what guns you have, which is good for the government, not so, not so good for you. So we're going to get to our next story here in a moment. And 
But I what I'm doing here while I do the show is I'm actually recording the segments. So there will be like a little pause as I get ready to record the next segment. And we're going to go on to our next story. Ladies and gentlemen, from our Liberty Tech segment, this is the headline. Boom. This is a really fascinating story, actually. Commercial drone maker seeks to prevent drones flying into ISIS territory. The unintended, the law of unintended consequences here is is at work, which always happens. But well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the 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 choices part of this article, which in this case happens to be right in the beginning. Chinese drone man. Oh, by the way, this is from antiwar.com. Chinese drone manufacturer DJI, the world's largest maker of commercial drones, has issued a software update designed to prevent its products from functioning at all in large portions of Iraq and Syria with an eye toward preventing ISIS from using them to drop bombs with modified off-the-shelf drones. Software Geofencing is common, mostly aiming to prevent drones from flying in very specific areas like airports, uh, though this is by far the largest effort and the first directly intended to prevent the drones from being used for makeshift military purposes. Now, from a liberty perspective, the interesting thing, uh, the well, I'll say the, the dangerous side of this technology is I can see down the road that and maybe it's already happening. Maybe it's being done without any laws being passed. Uh, maybe laws will be, quote unquote, required to be passed. That is that they'll have some sort of receiving device on all drones that are manufactured so that if and when the government wants to update the software so that the drones can't fly within a certain area, they might be able to do that so that they can make sure that the right information from the government's perspective is going out and not the wrong information. In this incident, again, it's a great thought, which is, hey, now, let's not let the quote-unquote bad guys, ISIS, be able to use these drones. We don't want blood on our hands. But it'll be used to say, hey, let's not let them get overhead views of protests or crackdowns or, or anything like that. Much like you see ghost gunning emerging in the gun industry, I suspect... You're going to see ghost droning emerging in the drone industry. Okay, so as I'm doing these, I'm, mm, I think I'm probably going to create some sort of automatic tag to put at the end of the videos because while I'm doing a live stream, it'll probably be really annoying for you guys to hear uh, after the end of each video. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. And our YouTube channel is youtube.com backslash C backslash state of wake. Or I can just add a tag which I think I'll do. I'll create a video tag and put that at the end here. See, this is why you do these things as you're doing them. Like, oh, yeah, uh, as I listen to it, that's probably not going to be an awesome idea. So we're going to go on and get ready for the next story. Oh, wow. I'm not sure if I recorded that. I did get it recorded on, uh, well, obviously it's recording on the live stream, but okay. Anyway, I'm just going to go on to the next story. Our next story 
is coming from, you know what? I don't want to say our next story in the part where I'm recording. I'm going to stop that. I don't want to say we're our next story in the part where we're recording because there'll be standalone videos. So somebody here, our next story. So I'll say before I start recording, our next story is from the legal perspective. What happens when laws are created that mm, they kind of contradict one another? especially when localities have different beliefs, interests than the na national laws. In this case, we're going to talk about illegal immigration. So this story is from our legal department, and it has to do with illegal immigration. And there's your headline. This is from the Libertarian Republic. Alternative Sentencing of illegal immigrants creates unequal justice system, says experts. So we'll get to the, the key part here. Brooklyn and Baltimore prosecutors have instructed staff to consider alternative offenses and sentence modifications for illegal immigrants to protect them from possible deportation. Acting Brooklyn District Attorney Eric Gonzalez said in a statement that his new policy aims to prevent collateral consequences of convictions for illegal immigrants. In other words, they don't want to set off any triggers that will bring in federal operatives to ensure that these quote-unquote illegal immigrants are deported. Gonzalez instructed his assistants to consider alternative offenses the defendant can plead to as well as reasonable modifications to the sentence modifications. The alternative offense uh, should be similar in level and length of sentence to that offered to a citizen defendant. But the charge may be different, Gonzalez said. For example, a plea to a misdemeanor trespass may be offered when appropriate instead of a misdemeanor drug offense, he said. And then you have Art Arthur, who's a resident fellow in law and policy for Center and Immigration Studies, who said, and I'll highlight this section here, Essentially, it creates two sets of rules, one for those who are here illegally and one for those who are not. I believe that's just wrong. A guiding principle of this country is that there is equal justice under the law. In essence, this sets up an unequal justice system. Well, first, first of all, a rule of law is a myth. There is no rule of law. There's only rule of power. Power is the only rate of exchange between two entities that do not share voluntarily the same standards. But be that as it may, let's just play devil's advocate and operate within the rule of law parameter. What you have is the federal government, which is aggressively going after people that are being called illegal immigrants. <laughs> I, the, the, the idea of putting a term illegal on a human being just seems really, really strange to me. And you have these so-called sanctuary cities that are trying not to gather people up and deport them. And to do that, they have to go to extra legal lengths to try to protect the quote-unquote illegal aliens. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you are on the side of not having people deported because they didn't come to the, you know, they didn't, they didn't cross a magical line in the, in the proper way, then you probably shouldn't be for what they're doing uh, because they're going to create even more animosity towards these quote-unquote illegal aliens. No matter what you tell them, if you could show them, no, no, they're pretty much getting the same type of punishment, 
well, not not really. They're not going to. I mean, they may get initially the same type of punishment, but they're not going to have the same stuff on their record. It's it's. I mean, a, a trespass charge. You get so many trespass charges and. That doesn't set off a chain of events. You get so many drug charges, and that sets off a chain of events that leads to extra sentencing that has to do with the amount of drug charges that you have. Be that as it may, the perception, you're not going to be able to avoid it, that there is, just like this guy said, special rules, special privileges for quote-unquote illegal aliens. Yeah. Your help for these folks is going to do them much more harm than good in the long run. All right, I think I got that one right. I recorded it right. And now this next story is going to be a challenge because I have both an article and a video. And I'll, I'll see if I do this smoothly or if I'm totally ate up. Okay, so the next story that we're going to do is, well, it's the story about the Delta Airlines guy. Well, he's not a Delta Airlines guy, but he was on a Delta Airlines flight, and uh, he was told to leave the plane because he didn't want to hold his toddler in a seat to put the toddler in the safety seat. Well, I'll get to the story here now. How about I do that? The story, I suppose, comes from our what the heck are you thinking market department. I don't even know if that's a department that's going to stick, but I'm going to call this story that for right now. And boom, there's your headline. This is from thedailysheeple.com. By the way, I highly recommend The Daily Sheeple. I look at it just about every day, and I know at least one person who writes for The Daily Sheeple won't mention that person's name, but you know who you are. The headline here is, Family Refuses to Give Up Toddler Seat on Delta Flight and Are Threatened with Jail. That's right, jail and kids being taken. So this is this is the significant part of this article here. Brian and Brittany Shear of Huntington Beach, California, were on a red-eye flight on April 23rd from Maui to Los, to Los Angeles when they were told that they had to give one of their seats to another passenger. The ordeal began when the airline asked the family to give up a seat they had purchased that was occupied by their two-year-old Grayson. The airline wanted the family to carry him on their laps for the flight instead. After the Shears tried to refuse, explaining repeatedly and calmly that they purchased that seat and needed to use it, the airline staff made an outrageous threat. You have to give up the seat. Are you going to jail? Your wife is going to jail, and they'll take your kids from you. Despite feeling they were in the right, that threat was terrifying, Brittany Shear told ABC News. As a mother, you have a one-year-old and a two-year-old. It doesn't matter whether that's true or false. It put fear in me. Now, uh, some of the headlines you'll read is something along the line of, alleged that he alleges that this happened well folks we're gonna go and play just the beginning part of this video and in the beginning of the part of this video you're gonna see well there's no alleged about it absolutely unless of course uh, George Lucas got a hold of this video and applied his magic Lucas special effects, whatever the heck that crap is called, CGI, CGI'd this. If he didn't CGI this, this is what it is. I'm going to play it. So their policy is if you're not going to abide, you're not going to 
not the deep well, then they can re then they can remove me off the plate. Yeah, so yeah, that's be a fine. Federal offense, and then you and your wife will be in jail, and your kids will be. Okay, that's all right. Okay. okay. So my kid, wait. So my wife, oh, we're gonna be in jail, and my kids are gonna. Be I don't know. I I think I should go back. Did you hear that? Let's just play that again here. I'll go back a little bit. You and your wife will be in jail, and your kids will be. Okay, that's all right. Okay. So my kid, wait. So my. So yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's all right. Okay. So my kid, wait. So my wife, oh, we're gonna be in jail, and my wife, kids are gonna be what? Your kids are going to be taken away from you. She's threatening to put him in jail, and take those kids, and well, take the kids away from the parents because he will not give up his seat. We'll play a little bit more. I bought that seat. Okay, I, I understand it's from Mesa, right? Right. Right. I I paid. I got him a ticket on another flight so that my son would have a seat. And you're saying, and you're saying, you're just gonna, you're gonna give that away to someone else. That when I paid for that seat, that's not right. I understand, but you'll, that Mason's not here, so the seat. I understand, but I really don't give a crud. You need to no. You need to do what's right. Yeah. I bought the seat, and you need to just leave us alone. So Mason's not here, so Mason cannot be the one that owns the seat. I, no, I paid for the seat. I bought the seat. You can you can it's look and see. Doesn't matter. He's, he's my. It's my son. It's, it's, it's not matter. On the way out, the flight was open, but even then, it was difficult to have a lap child. So we decided to get him a ticket on an earlier flight so we can use his seat and put the car seat and let the kids sleep because it's a, it's a red eye. He won't sleep unless he's in his car seat. So otherwise he'd be sitting in my wife's lap crawling all over the place and it's not as safe. So we decided to do it that way and have, let him use his seat. I, I paid for the seat. This is what's ridiculous. So, and before... People say, well, you know, if you read the fine print and, you know, this is, this is a private company, their private property, you got to honor their private property. Well, their private property is getting the government involved. That's one point. And the other point is whether it's legal, whether he signed a contract with details that none of us reads or not, whether this company is legally fine or not, what's happening here is not fine from a market perspective. If you want to treat your customers like this, if you want to continue a policy that says that if I buy a ticket and you oversell, that I have to leave. When you're the one who oversold, it's your freaking problem. Not mine, your problem. The problem is that you have a policy that says that you're going to oversell. Now, if you can get away with that, if the market says, hey, we're willing to live with it, okay, that, that market has spoken. I seriously doubt, though, as these stories start to emerge more and more, that the, the market is going to be happy with that. And since there's more than one airline, some airline somewhere is going to take the opportunity to say, hey, and guess what? If you book your flight with us, we guarantee we won't kick you off. I want to go toward the end here. I want, to, I want you to hear how, well, <laughs> the, the, the empathy and the understanding from this flight attendant who, I got to tell you, if I owned this 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 fine airline Delta, this flight attendant would not be a flight attendant anymore. You should, you should be nowhere near customer service ever again. You should really think about going, working on computers or something that you can work in the back room and not talk to anybody. Cause that's definitely talking to people. Miss, miss flight attendant ain't your thing. Did you want to take Get off on your own? So wait, what are we what are we supposed to do once we're off this plane? There it is. Up to me and the rest is everybody wants well, to go be. Off. You hear that? What are we supposed to do? He has two children, a one year old and a two year old. And he's asking, what are we supposed to do? And she says, Hey my problem. Hey man, listen, you bought a ticket, you signed the contract. The contract said if we oversell, we can kick one of you out. We're kicking your kid off, so, you know, you can stay. 
And maybe let your kid go, you know, hey, that's the letter of the law. Or you can all leave. And good luck. It's not. At this point, you guys are on your own. At this point, you guys are on your own. We totally boned you. We screwed you. You know, you bought the ticket, you gave us your money, and we totally hosed you one end to the other. But it's not my problem, man. What about our bags? And this is, this is a, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to play any more of this. I've, I've played enough. This is, this is the just following orders mentality that you have here. Not only just follow orders, but go beyond and invent stuff to make it seem like you're talking with authority. This is the kind of person that you never want to have a gun policing other people. Even in a world where you have private security, this woman is not the person that you want doing that job because she will, she will officiously invent code to assure that she's the authority, that she's the one controlling the situation, even if it means threatening to take a man's children away from him. In essence, uh, you could argue, well, he, you know, in essence, because he wouldn't leave the plane. No, no, no. In essence, because this company overbooked a flight. And by the letter of the law, by that little contract that he signed, possibly, and I'm not even saying that, that it's right. Maybe, maybe even by their own contract and bylaws, it's not right. But even if it is, what the, the, I don't know many people who could look at that and say, "Hey, this is a good business practice. This is how you should treat your customers." You would think that Delta was a government-run airline. If this was a government-run airline, I think everybody would like, "Yep." It's the way it's done, man. It's like DMV Airlines, <laughs> but it's not DMV Airlines. It's Delta Airlines, and I don't think this is going to end well with Delta. You know, I, I know they, they in the article, it talked about uh, United Airlines dragging the dude off and bloodying him up, but I got to tell you, I mean, that's, that's not good, and he got physically messed up, but I actually think this is worse. This is worse. He's threatening a man's family. You are directly threatening a man's family and you're leaving that family high and dry. They, they explained in the video that, you know, it's, it's late at night. There's nowhere where for them to go. They got a one-year-old and a two-year-old. The, the next flight is not going to be until the morning. So overnight, what are they going to be sleeping on the airport floor? Yeah. I actually think this is worse than the, the United flights situation. Definitely. I understand the dude took a few blows and I'm not, I'm not advocating uh, anyone who hasn't directly harmed another person take, take a few blows. But, and I got to tell you, from my perspective, I would much rather take a few blows than deal with what this guy had to deal with. All right, so that, that went okay, I guess. I got, uh, I, I like that. I got, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, I don't know if I'm going to do this next story. This, I don't think I will. I'm going to X out of this next story here. Oh, yeah, hey, I'm going to do this. this. This next story, I'm going to, this is, I'll just do it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is from our World News Headline Department. Boom. There's your headline. This is from nextbigfuture.com. And the title is, Collapse of Venezuela Government is a Matter When and Not If. I wonder if that's supposed to say a matter of when and not if. Well, whatever. So you see some some nice pictures here. This is doing a little shopping. Just a little shopping for some, I don't know, containers or something. 
Oh, you got a fine display of containers here and uh, maybe some store signs. Store signs? Store signs? Ooh, store signs. Look, the lights are still on. See that? Commu, commu capitalism li lives. And it's great. I think it's like commu capitalism or some weird hybrid that they're attempting down there. So here's the, here's the, the, the highlighted part here. The economic demise of the Soviet Union offers a likely scenario for Venezuela's future evolution. The financial crisis is likely to worsen because any significant change in policy would imply an admission by Maduro that his policies had been wrong. Would imply... Or excuse me, let me read that again. The financial crisis is likely to worsen because any significant change in policy would imply an admission by Maduro that his policies had been wrong, which would probably lead to his ouster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although he is uh, setting to arm his newly deputized thug force and trying to disarm everybody else. Thus, the budget de deficit, shortages, inflation, exchange rate fell, and public debt are likely to grow much worse. One alternative could be a preemptive political overthrow of the Maduro regime fueled by public discontent or that the rulers just flee the country. Dude, I'm thinking fleeing the country. Yeah, you might want to consider that. Another possible end game would be that the country runs out of international currency reserves and defaults on its foreign debt. Dude, you don't mess with your foreign debt because the foreign debt holders don't play. That would deprive Venezuela of all foreign credit and the natural consequence would be a complete collapse of imports and the exchange rate of the Bolivar. De Beliva, the country's currency. The Maduro regime is not likely to survive for long because it won't be capable of making the necessary adjustments that avoid abject economic misery for most of the population, and the pressure on it will eventually become intolerable. Now, I wonder if that's true. I wonder if If the Venezuelan people may find themselves acclimating to their new misery and, and find new levels of hierarchy that make people, all, all of them still relatively within a framework of misery, or for the most part, except for a very, very, very tiny leap view, that they may find a pecking order where, you know, maybe, maybe the new Elites, not the elite of the elite, but maybe the new elites get uh, four loaves of bread a week <laughs> instead of one loaf of bread a month or whatever rations they're dealing with. I'm not sure whether the, the Venezuelan government is actually going to collapse anytime soon. I, I would imagine it's probably more likely that one of the major powers, whether it's the United States, China, Russia, will probably execute some sort of coup. They're going to need, probably going to need some sort of foreign aid, foreign intelligence, weapons, whatever the case might be. And there will be a cost. And the cost will be that you'll be beholden to whichever master rescued you. So I guess right now, who are the big players that would be interested in this? It would be Russia, China, the U.S. Man, I imagine China would love to have, have somebody in there that was friendly to China. Open up some ports to the Chinese. As, as well as the Russians and as, as, as well as America. So maybe behind the scenes, there's already a secret battle going on in the intelligence world between the Chinese, the Americans, and the Russians to see who gets Venezuela because uh, they socialismed so much that they ended up making themselves a big, fat, easy target for one of the big boys.
All right. I'm going to the last story. This is the last story. So I will have done one, two, three, four, five. This will be the sixth story. Eh? I don't know. I might just do five stories or four. I'm not sure. But either way, I'm going to go ahead and do this last story anyway. I could have easily done this story first. All right. This is... I, I guess let's just say that this is from our uh, America ain't as free as America thinks it is department. In the headline, boom! Land of the free? Harvard study ranks America worse in the West for fair elections. This is from globalresearch.ca. I'll read the, the key part here. As if further proof could possibly be needed of the sorry state of the American electoral process, a new study just ranked the United States dead last in electoral, electoral integrity among established Western democracies. I don't know what qualifies as a established Western democracy, but whatever. The Electoral Integrity Project, EIP, uh, their 2015 year in elections report is an independent, oh my, wait, wait, this is the 2015 election. They didn't even talk about the 2016 election. Wow. If there's a dead last, 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 and they're probably dead last, 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 last. Now, instead of just dead last, uh, independent research project by 2,000 elections experts from Harvard University and the University of Sydney in Australia assembled to examine the world's elections. The EIP states that the core notion of electoral integrity refers to agreed international principles and standards of elections applying universally to all countries worldwide throughout the electoral cycle including during the pre-electoral period, the campaign, and on polling day, and it's aftermath. I'll just, you know, one more little, I should have highlighted this too. The report gathers assessments from over 2,000 experts to evaluate the perceived integrity of all 100 national parliamentary and presidential contests held between July 1st, 2012, to December 31st, 2015, in 139 countries worldwide. These include 54 national elections last year. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I find really interesting about this article globalresearch.ca has done. I'm not sure why. Why are you actually measuring electoral integrity? Because there's no such thing. I mean, even if even if all the votes counted, <laughs> well, I I suppose I, I I'll I'll amend that. If 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 there's some sort of mm, very local election on a very like not electing a candidate so much as electing or voting on an issue, like do we raise our taxes? Or do we not raise our taxes? I'm surprised at how many times people vote and say, yeah, yeah I'm, 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 go ahead, I vote, but, but, go ahead, raise the taxes. They're usually the people that are not going to be hurt that much by the taxes being raised, but that's another issue. But the assumption here that somehow that elections have some sort of integrity to them in the first place is, well, you, you realize where you're starting from and where you're starting from is that democracy is a good way for a small group of people to determine how to rule over a large segment of other people. And it's, it's totally cool if a majority decides what a minority might like, might not want to do. In other words, mobocracy, 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 is cool. But even notwithstanding that reality, you think you live in the land of the free, folks. Freedom is a relative thing. 
there are areas in your life where depending on where you live, you have more opportunity or less opportunity to make a free will choice to exercise your preference. For instance, if you live in Pennsylvania and you prefer to carry a gun, a concealed carry, it's relatively easy to get a concealed carry license, relatively easy. You, you do have to pay and you have to get an approval, but it's, it's, it's relatively easy to get an approval. So you, you, there's not too many barriers between you and exercising your preference to carry a gun. But if you live in New Jersey, well, then if carrying a gun concealed carry is your preference, well, your chances of actually getting it legally are pretty small. So if, if you go through all the paperwork, which you're going to have to fill out a lot of paperwork, you're going to pay more money than you do in Pennsylvania and, and more, more likely than not, you're not going to get approved. So if you go through that process, well, and you don't get approved, then you have to make a decision. If, if I want to exercise that preference to carry a gun, I have to realize that I'm putting myself at risk of having the weight of the state come down upon me and I could be threatened with guns and thrown in a cage or killed if I resist. So freedom is a relative thing. If you live in New Jersey and you don't really care about carrying a gun concealed, it's not really an issue for you. You may There may be other things in New Jersey that you're more free to do in Pennsylvania. In China, if you want to set up a local business, not, I'll say not a brick and mortar business, but a little, you know, put a table up somewhere, throw some merchandise on it, set it anywhere you want, go to business. Hey, dude, you can actually do that in China way easier than you can in the United States. The chances of somebody showing up in China to ask you for your papers, hmm, slim to none. In the United States, it's, it's much, much more likely that that'll happen. So if your preference is to make a living with a small roadside business and you don't want to be bothered, China. China is the place to go. You have more freedom in China. So what this report is, is really talking about is, is within the parameter that accepts that democracy is a good thing. And it's measuring accountability, integrity by the candidate being chosen that the majority of people truly want. In the United States, you have a lot less likely chance of having that happen than you do in whatever these traditional democracies are. So, yay America, land of the free. And there you go. I've done it. I will, I think I will try to do this on Monday. Maybe get it down to maybe five. I think maybe five stories is, is a, is a good parameter here and I'll play around with the format and see how it works. Anybody who was watching this while I was doing it, I thank you. And it looks like I've had, uh, I, I didn't promote this out or anything. So if anybody saw this, it's a miracle. And I didn't promote it out because it's just a test, but I actually did have uh, 35 people watch it. So thank you very much. All you or excuse me, not 35. No, 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 no. I had 15, 15 people watch this live. Probably get a few more in the archive. But anyway, you 15, since I didn't promote it, didn't do anything, thank you for showing up. I don't know how you found the video, but uh, thank you. And we're going to go ahead and end this, this live stream. Thank you for joining me, Paul Gordon of Newsfire at newsfire.tv, which is, I'm going to say, a subsidiary, maybe that's not the right word, of iState.
TV. Or if you have a hard time remembering that, go to is tv.me.